Alex's Caves is a mod that adds five new cave biomes to the overworld. Unlike most normal biomes, these cave biomes are exceedingly rare, yet they all contain a variety of unique blocks, items, mobs and mechanics that makes them considerable subterranean destinations. To find any of these cave biomes, you'll need to discover an underground cabin anywhere in the overworld. Inside any underground cabin should be both a spelunkery table and a barrel containing some cave tablets, and there is also a chance for a copy of the cave compendium to appear here. The spelunkery table found in the underground cabins can be used to turn cave tablets into cave codices by translating them into something less arcane. To begin this process, place a tablet and a paper in the spelunkery table and try to guess the correct possession of the hidden word using the context of previous guesses. There are only five guesses per level in this minigame and three levels required to produce a cave codex. Once a cave codex is researched, simply using the item in your main hand will unlock more info pertaining to the codices biome in the cave compendium. There are four chapters for every biome that can be unlocked this way, and they are unlocked in the sequential order of general, resources, inhabitants, and utilities. Cave biome maps can be crafted with just a single codex and can be used to find the nearest biome of the codex's type. Since the biomes added by Alex's caves are all somewhat rare, these maps can take a while to load and will display ellipses on their texture while doing so. The magnetic caves can be characterized by giant neodymium crystals emerging from a terrain composed of galena. These crystals are where this cave gets its name from, and they come in two varieties, scarlet neodymium and azure neodymium. Galena is a type of stone with a significant ion composition that common found in the magnetic cave, it can be crafted into numerous kinds of bricks, pillars, and other blocks, and packed galena, and the packed galena can then be smelted to produce a single nugget of iron. Although this requires a great deal of galena to create a single ingot of iron, it exists in such vast quantities in this cave biome that make it a good alternative to seeking out iron ore. Far more valuable of a resource than galena is neodymium though, the raw of both scarlet and azure neodymium can be obtained by breaking both pillars and nodes that make up the giant crystals of this biome. Neodymium ingots have many uses, the scarlet neodymium ingot crafted into create seeking arrows, and the azure neodymium ingot can be used to create magnetic levitation rails. The levitation rails can lift any mine cart and over them into the air, it also moves faster than any normal rail. The seeking arrows will curve towards any nearby entity they fly past. Meditating over the floor of the magnetic caves is the Teletier, Galena covered beings of dubious origin. Although they may seem calm and collected while doing this, Teletier are extremely hostile. Above their large, magnetic heads usually rests an iron tool of some kind. This tool is their main weapon, and they can move it back and forth to deal continuous ranged damage. These tools can be anything from a weak iron hoe to an enchanted iron sword. Using their magnetic meditation powers, Teletier also have the latent ability to fly. Although only at slow speeds, they can strafe in the air while attacking, making them a danger. If slain, a Teletier can drop a Telecorp with some Scarlet or Azure Neodymium. This makes them a renewable source of these precious minerals, although this comes at a cost. The Magnetron is an uncommon, powerful being encountered in the magnetic caves. This monster was once a machine created to help extract resources from this place, although the fate of its makers are unknown. Magnetrons keep a deceptive low profile before initiating combat, slowly rolling around on their central heart. However, if an intruder is detected, the Magnetron will begin to form a giant body around itself using nearby blocks. The electromagnetic properties of this monster are fully visible during this process as lightning arches between each block making up its body. The blocks that make up its new body are important. Magnetrons will favor magnetic blocks over inert ones. If a sawmill or anvil is nearby, these will be incorporated into the body as weapons and increase the damage dealt by the monster. Once defeated, the magnetron will fall apart and its many blocks will disperse. But what will also fall down as a block is its heart of iron. What appears to be one creature is actually a mechanical being composed of two separate parts, a head and a walking winch, bound by a chain, this composite creature is known as the Boundroidy. Of all the denizens of the magnetic caves, the Boundroid is the one most likely to sneak up on its hapless prey. This being is usually found clinging to the ceiling of the subterranean biome, with its head dragging below on a chain. If a target is spotted, the Boundroid will attempt to clamber to above the target's position and quickly slam down to the ground to deal damage. This attack is strong, but does leave the Boundroid open to attack. 
If the winch of the boundroid is shot at while it is on the ceiling, the whole composite creature will fall to the ground, shaking in fear. However, it will quickly attempt to leap back up onto the ceiling. What first appears to be an innocuous slime in the magnetic caves is actually a ferroslime, a variant of slime that has adapted to this biome's natural ferromagnetic properties. Due to this, the ferroslime is able to levitate to get around, although it can only move in the straight lines on the cardinal axis. Unlike other slimes that simply split when slain, the ferroslime is able to merge with outer ferroslimes in order to grow in size and strength. The more heads inside the ferroslime, the harder it will be to defeat. Once slain, ferroslime will split into smaller versions of themselves, and they will also drop a ferroslime ball at the smallest size. The noter is a strange hovering, passive creature found in the magnetic caves. Although it cannot attack, they are definitely nuisances in their own right, as noters will attempt to scan any foreign beings nearby. Noters will use these scans to build a hologram in order to report back to monsters in this biome about possible invaders. Any monster witnessing these holograms will instantly know where to focus its aggressive energy on. When killed, noters can drop a noter gizmo, the source of their holographic abilities. The magnets are very powerful, as azure ones can move magnetic blocks away from them, and scarlet ones can attract magnetic blocks to them. A magnet can move up to 27 adjacent blocks at a time, provided they have enough clearance and are all either metallic or connected to metallic blocks by a slime block. The Galena Gauntlet can be used in the offhand, while a magnetic tool such as one made of iron or netherite is held in the main hand. When used, it will launch the tool forwards, up to around 20 blocks in distance. From here, the tool will damage any entity it is rammed into, or begin to mine any block if it is the matching kind for the tool. The holocoder can be bound to any entity by using them. When placed in a hologram projector, a hologram of the bound entity will be displayed. If the holocoder is unbound, then the user of the holocoder will be shown instead. The magnetic quarry smasher is only useful when combined with four magnetic lights and the magnetic quarry itself. When a magnetic quarry is placed, the bounds of the area to be automatically mined out by it can be marked by creating a rectangle with four magnetic lights behind the magnetic quarry block. Once lightning is seen darting between all four light, the quarry smasher can be placed inside these bounds to activate the quarry. The quarry will continue to mine out any breakable blocks underneath its designated area, and once smashed these blocks drops will be sent flying out of the top of the main magnetic quarry block. Once there are no more blocks to mine, the quarry hill become dormant. The resistor shield can be used as an ordinary shield, except that it creates a magnetic pulse while used that damages nearby foes. The polarity of this pulse can be switched by using the shield and sneaking at the same time. If the azure side is used, the pulse will repel afflicted entities, and if the scarlet side is used it will pull them closer. The primordial caves have been isolated from the rest of the world for untold millennia, perhaps for tens of millions of years. This isolation has led to the limestone-laden caves to have unique geology, flora and fauna that have gone extinct elsewhere in the world ages ago. The subterranean biome is kept well lit by amber sola, a novel form of amber that illuminates all blocks beneath it. It appears within amber clusters on the ceiling of these massive caves. Limestone makes up a majority of the stone of this cave biome. It can be worked into spears that deal low ranged and melee damage, yet are stackable. Limestone can also be smelted into smooth limestone. If charcoal is used on smooth limestone, a cave painting can be created. The subterranodon is a large, neutral flying reptile found in roosts on the sides of the primordial caves, or flying through its vast underground hollows. Although its large mouth is lined with spiky teeth, its diet consists mostly of aquatic life. Subterranodon nests are an occasional sight, emerging on rocky outcrops on pillars. A subterranodon can be tamed by feeding it a few Trilocaris tails. Tamed subterranodons can be made to follow, stay or wander when interacted with while sneaking. To ride a tamed subterranodon, simply interact with it. They can only fly upwards for a short period while carrying a rider in their feet, thus making frequent landings required. Still, they provide an excellent way to travel within the primordial caves. Valenraptors are pack-hunting dinosaurs found commonly within the primordial caves. 
Ever on the prowl, these beasts will attempt to take down prey big and small, from local golden frogs to even a grotoceratops, and even the occasional explorer. Attacking in tandem, these fearsome reptiles will leap great distances at their prey, all while others from their pack slash and bite, quickly dealing a large amount of damage in total. Valenraptors can also open doors and chests using their crafty hands, they will steal any neat items from chests they can find. If a dinosaur nugget is taken from a chest by a Valenraptor, it may enter a relaxed state after consuming it. During this relaxed state, the Valenraptor can be approached and fed a serene salad in order to tame it. Tamed Valenraptors can be made to follow, stay or wander, and are indispensable in combat due to their sneaky abilities. If a tamed Valenraptor loses a lot of its health in battle, it will enter a stealth mode and rapidly begin to heal, only to re-enter combat once safely recovered. Tamed Valenraptors can be bred with a dinosaur nugget and will lay a clutch of eggs afterwards, and baby Valenraptors that hatch nearby will imprint on their parents' owners. Grotoceratops are large, herbivorous dinosaurs that seem to think only ever of eating more plants. These voracious reptiles will gladly ignore almost anything else in their way, as long as it does not attack them first. Grotoceratops is the only source of fiddleheads, which appear after they pick up and eat a curly fern. If attacked, they will defend themselves by using their large horn to fling attackers in the air, or by swinging their spiked tail into their target. Grotoceratops can be bred with a tree star, and will lay a single egg afterwards. Trilocaris are small prehistoric arthropods that can be found swimming in the many lakes and pools of the primordial caves. They can survive both in and out of water, and can be captured in a bucket, and if killed will drop a Trilocaris tail. The Tremorsaurus is the king of all dinosaurs in the primordial caves, where it regularly hunts large prey such as Grotoceratops and Relicaris. The presence of one of these monstrous dinosaurs is indicated by the very earth-shaking for every footstep it takes. Water in lakes and cauldrons will also ripple in response. When hunting, the Tremorsaurus will unleash its roar, which will shake every nearby creature and send most of them running. Tremorsaurus can use its deadly bite force to quickly dispatch prey, but can also pick up smaller prey in its jaws and violently shake them for even more damage. Despite its hostile personality, even the Tremorsaurus can be tamed through a difficult process. It must be repeatedly hit with a primitive club in order to stun the beast, then fed serene salad right afterwards. This will wake it up and make it angry, but after enough attempts the Tremorsaurus will be tamed. Tame Tremorsaurus can be made to follow, stay or wander, and can also be ridden. When ridden, they are not quick, yet will attack anything aimed at by their rider. A mounted Tremorsaurus can also be made to occasionally roar, which can force entire crowds of enemies to flee tear. The Relicaris is a massive, neutral omnivorous dinosaur uncommonly found browsing the puan trees of the primordial caves. This feathery dinosaur is immensely strong, and can deal a lot of damage with its dagger-like claws. They will nibble at any tree leaves within the range of their long necks, and will reach down into pools to gobble up any Trilocaris they can find. One can utilize the natural strength of this dinosaur by feeding it a primordial soup, which will energize it to the point of knocking down almost any nearby tree it can find, all at once. Relicaris can be bred with a tree star, and will produce a single large egg afterwards. Occasionally when breaking amber, an amber curiosity can be discovered. These can be used to craft amber monoliths, which can also be seen dotting the primordial caves. Amber monoliths can populate the nearby area of animals over the course of a few days. The type of animal spawn depends on any nearby animals and the natural rate of occurrence of that animal. It is possible that the amber monoliths are the reason the primordial caves have stayed the same for eons. The Toxic Caves is a massive, underground wasteland that must have been created by the excesses of scientific hubris in ages long past. All that remains of this is an extremely hostile environment home to some equally dangerous hazards and monsters. The uranium ore frequent in this biome can be made into either nuggets or blocks, like other ores, it can also be turned into uranium rods, a new light source. Dust, which can be harvested by breaking large sulfur clusters. It can be used to create food that can heal the consumer even with the irradiated effect active. The green gas bubbling out of hydrothermal vents above acid can also be bottled into radon gas. This can be used to create large glowing radon lamps in any color. Cinder bricks can be found in remains littering the toxic caves and can be made into a variety of decorative industrial blocks or thrown to break any weak block. Nucleeper is some form of highly modified creeper with mechanical and atomic enhancements. This poor creature seems to be in a state of constant anguish, just like its normal creeper ancestors. 
Nucleepers are slow and take much longer to charge their explosive ability than normal creepers. This begins with the core of the creeper beginning to close, emitting a warning siren sound and bright flashing lights from its glowing green head. Once the core of the creeper has completely closed, an atomic explosion will appear and devastate the nearby area. Radgill are hideously mutated fish found swimming through pits of acid in the toxic caves. These three-eyed fish can occasionally be seen leaping from the acid into the air. Radgill can be captured in a bucket of acid and can also survive in water. If a radgill is slain, it can drop itself as an item, which can be cooked. The Brainiac is a monstrous mutant made of several zombies and other unknown monsters. Brainiacs are fast, aggressive strong, and in possession of a large tongue that can whip targets from a distance. Once nearby, Brainiacs will either smash their target with their arms, or use their jaw hand to snap at them. All Brainiac attacks have a chance to inflict the irradiated effect. Usually, Brainiacs can be found carrying around a waste drum on their backs when in combat, they can either drink this to heal quickly or use it as a range attack to spread acid near their targets. Gamma Roach is a gigantic radioactive cockroach found scuttling around the toxic caves. When injured, the Gamma Roach can release a cloud of radioactive gas as a defense. Although they are not strong fighters, Gamma Roaches can flee battle to find a stronger monster. Once they found a monster, they can pick it up and drop it off at their initial target. This makes them a constant threat whenever the irradiated effect is active. The Raycat is a skeletal, undead feline kept alive by its radioactive powers. Although somewhat intimidating with its green glow, this cat is passive. Raycats do not need to feed since they heal by absorbing radiation from other nearby creatures, but they still will gladly accept Radgill. Although they will not defend their owner in combat, they will keep Nucleepers at a distance and occasionally absorb any irradiated effect of their owner, and they can be bred with Radgills. The various resources of the toxic caves can be combined into a polymer platen, a highly resistant material, which can be assembled into hazmat armor, which lowers the damage and effects of irradiated and acid. Polymer plates can also be made into a remote detonator, which can activate marked explosives from elsewhere. Together with a fissile core and some uranium rods, it can also be crafted into the ray gun. This ranged weapon shoots a beam of radioactive energy that damages all entities in its path extremely quickly. While each attack may only deal one damage, it attacks four times as fast as a usual weapon can. Ray guns will also inflict irradiated to their targets, and they require uranium rods as fuel. The charred remnants dropped by Brainiacs can be used to make nuclear sirens, which produce a loud sound when a nuclear explosion is imminent in the area. To assemble a nuclear furnace, place eight components in a cube. Nuclear furnaces can smelt any items a blast furnace can five times as fast. Instead of burning coal, they use uranium rods as fuel. A uranium rod can smelt an entire stack of items. However, it produces some unrefined waste as a byproduct. To avoid the nuclear furnace entering criticality and exploding violently, this waste must be removed by placing metal barrels in the nuclear furnace, which will produce waste drums. Destroying these waste drums may prove to be difficult, as they can explode and leave lingering radiation. The most dangerous use of the toxic cave's resources is the nuclear bomb. This powerful weapon will create a truly massive explosion that destroys almost all blocks in a nearby area and deals thousands of damage and inflicting irradiated three. This kind of destruction may be the very cause of the toxic caves itself. The Forlorn Hollows is an underground cavern system engulfed with pure darkness. Almost no light shines here, as the biome is unnaturally shrouded with a thick shadow. The large subterranean mammals native to the Forlorn Hollows have deposited enough guano over time for it to petrify into a kind of rock, guanostone, and some of this has also turned into another rock, coprolith. The piles of guano that litter the floor of the Forlorn Hollows can be crafted into fertilizer. Fertilizer works like bone meal, except it is much stronger. It can also be used to create thornwood sapling from branches, a new type of darkness tree. The layers of deposited guana stone can also bear redstone ore, making the forlorn hollows a source of redstone at higher depths than usual, and coprolith can also contain coal ores. 
Glumoths are large, passive insects found fluttering through the darkness of the forlorn hollows. These bugs are prey to many of the large mammals here, and like their predator, they have also been twisted by the darkness, though nowhere near as much. Glumoths naturally seek out light sources, as it is part of how they navigate. This leads them to cluster around light-emitting blocks such as torches. Underzealots are intelligent, mole-like cultists found wandering the forlorn hollows these hostile creatures have poor vision, so they have a naturally low detection range. Fighting them is not easy, as after every slash from their claws, they will burrow underground and appear somewhere else nearby. Underzealots almost always appear in groups, making combat with them even more difficult. Fearing light, underzealots will regularly any many light sources they can, including torches. But there are worse reasons to fear these stout cultists, their rituals. When they find a gloomoth presumably one fluttering around a low-lying torch, they will attempt to run after it and catch it. If they do, then a ritual will start if three or more other underzealots take notice. During this ritual, an eminence of a dark, otherworldly power will briefly appear in this realm. It will focus all of its dark energy on the hapless sacrifice, warping it into a new kind of monster for Glumoths. This new monster is the Watcher. But as mentioned prior, the Underzealots do have poor vision, and often they will attempt to pick up another flying creature that makes its home in the Forlorn Hollows. When the sacrifice is complete for this creature, an extremely powerful monster is created, one that even the Underzealots have no control of. The Watcher is a monster that can be found in the Forlorn Hollows, but only appears as the result of an underzealot sacrifice of a Gloomoth. Watchers will seek out any adventurer over a great distance, and begin to stalk them. Occasionally, they make their presence known by possessing their target to see the world from the Watcher's perspective. During this possession, the target cannot move, and afterwards the Watcher's moth face appears shortly in their vision. When a Watcher is close enough, it will quickly lash out with its sharp claws, before transforming into an ethereal flying form. It will then continuously possess its target whilst lashing out, making it a difficult fight. Corodents are fossorial rodents found tunneling through the walls and floors of the forlorn hollows. These hostile beasts will emerge when they detect prey near them and attempt to bite with their sharp front teeth. They can be difficult to fight due to their ability to easily move through almost any block. But corodents are deathly afraid of all light, and simply placing a bright light like a torch near them will shock and scare them. Vespers are gigantic bats twisted by the darkness of the forlorn hollows. They can either be found in pursuit of blooms, their favorite prey, or roosting, hanging the ceiling. These hostile bats will attack any adventurer that landers beneath them while roosting, and will continuously swoop in and out of the darkness to deal a nasty bite. If blocked with a shield, they will be temporarily grounded, making them easier to defeat. Forsaken are by far the most powerful monster to be found in the Forlorn Hollows, although they are only created when underzealots perform a ritual on a Vesper. They are hostile towards almost anything that is not of the Forlorn Hollows, and will attempt to eat as many Glumoths as possible. Imbued with some of the most potent dark magic, Forsaken have a vast array of attacks that they use to quickly dispatch prey. This includes using their large upper arms to smash the ground beneath them, slash at prey or even lift and bring the prey to the mouth for a killer bite. Forsaken can also emit a long-range sonic blast with incredible reach, and a short-range sonic blast that damage all hostiles in close range. These sonic blasts deal extra damage towards monsters that utilize sound, such as the Warden. When brought down to low health, the Forsaken's shadowy magical aspects will become readily apparent as it becomes pitch black, except for its red eyes. Donning this shadow state, the Forsaken will rapidly heal as long as it is out of direct light. If slain, the Forsaken will drop multitudes of pure darkness. The moth dust dropped by Glumoths can be held on to throw over a short distance. Any creature it hits ill becomes scent marked as a moth, and will be attacked by most of the nearby forlorn hollows moths. It can also be crafted into moth balls, which can keep Glumoths away from light sources when placed. The desolate dagger dropped by underzealots may seem weak based on its low attack damage, but after every hit, a red, ghostly version of the dagger will damage above the target. This red blade deals an additional, delayed attack. The occult gem has multiple uses, it can be turned into a totem of possession, which can be bound to any creature by hitting it. Once bound, the creature can then be controlled by holding down the totem and looking where it should move. Note that the creature should be visible for this dark magic to work. The totem only has limited durability, but any other creature the possessed one collides with will trigger it to attack. The occult gem can also be made into a beholder, another occult gem can be bound to this block, 
and using it anywhere else in the world will allow one to see the beholder, note that it cannot be used across dimensions. The teeth of the Corodon can be crafted into burrowing arrows, which will chew through and mine up to five blocks when they land, and they pierce targets. Vesper wings can be made into Vesper stew, one of the few sources of food in the depths of the Forlorn Hollows. The pure darkness can be used to create the Dread Bow, it loads arrows slower than normal bows, but when fired, a volley of multitudes of arrows will fall from above the target. Its normal arrows are loaded, they will be transformed into shadowy arrows that deal multiple attacks and appear in a far great number. Shadow Silk can be used to create the Hood of Darkness and Cloak of Darkness. When both of these armor pieces are worn together, a meter appears showing the current darkness power, which is increased by staying within areas devoid of light. Once this meter is full, the wearer can enter Shadow Mode, which will grant them extremely fast flight for 10 seconds, but this ability only works if they stay within the darkness. To increase the length of this effect unnaturally, a darkened apple can be eaten while in Shadow Mode. The Abyssal Chasm is a biome found deep in the world, but unlike other cave biomes it is covered by hundreds of blocks of water, not stone. It is found exclusively under ocean biomes, and appears as a massive trench where light barely penetrates. The trench walls are lined with Abyss Marine, a stone-like block, and the Abyssal floors covered in a thick layer. Mussels can often be found growing on any solid surface in the Abyssal Chasm. Over time, they can increase in number and spread to nearby blocks, and can be cooked. When broken, there is a chance for a mussel to drop one of its precious pearls, which can be made into an abyssal altar, presumably to offer something to the strange beings that call the abyssal chasm home. Occasionally, sea glass shards can be obtained when breaking muck. These shards can be reassembled to normal glass, or used to create depth glass which allows better visibility when placed next to water. The lanternfish is the smallest fish found in the abyssal chasm, yet it makes up for its diminutive size for the large shoals of them that spawn throughout the waters of this biome. Like a few other deep-sea species, this animal has light-emitting spots on its body, which help distinguish it from the dark depths. Lanternfish shoals move closer to the surface at night, making them a convenient way to find abyssal chasms. They can be captured in a bucket of water, and if slain, a lanternfish will drop itself, and can be cooked for a meager snack. Sea pigs are gelatinous invertebrates found on the sea floor within the abyssal chasm. Slowly trudging along on their many legs, they sift through the muck to look for anything edible. Sea pigs can drop themselves if they die, and can be eaten, although their flesh is poisonous, and they can be captured with a bucket of water. If fed muck, a clay ball or mud, the sea pig will begin to digest the item. They may produce a decent amount of muck or clay during this, but can also return bone meal, sea glass shards, pearls, and even marine snow. The Hallbreaker is a colossal fish over 15 blocks long. Being a predator adapted to hunt exclusively in dark waters, it hunts by seeking out any glowing entity. It quickly makes a kill by using its massive teeth to bite prey or its head as a battering ram to smash them. The easiest way to avoid the wandering eyes of a Hallbreaker is to stop emitting light and to remove any glowing effect or entity. Hallbreakers always investigate possible prey items before attacking, circling them multiple times whilst its many body lights begin to flash rapidly. In the almost unheard of chance that one is defeated in combat, it will spew out what it has eaten before dying. This includes common items like ink sacks, but can also be remains of submarines such as the Enigmatic Engine. Gossamer norms are large polychaete worms found swimming around the waters of the abyssal chasm. These drifting glowing worms are a favorite treat of the Hallbreaker. If slain, they can drop bioluminescence, the source of their blue glow, and they can be captured with a bucket of water. The tripod fish is a bizarre fish found near the seafloor of the abyssal caves. Although they are decent swimmers, they can often be spotted resting above the seafloor on three large spines emerging from their fins. Tripod fish can be captured with a bucket of water, and if slain they can drop themselves, and they can be cooked for a heartier meal. The Deep Ones are some of the most mysterious and poorly understood beings in all the overworld. There are three species of Deep One, and they all live in a harmonious balance with each other, forming a single syncretic society. Initially, all Deep Ones will be wary of outsiders. They will follow and stalk any intruders to their abyssal domain from the shadows, and attempt to flee if spotted. If a Deep One is cornered, it will toss an ink bomb and then disappear from sight. If hurt, the opinion of the attacker for all Deep Ones will decrease permanently, and they will eventually become outright hostile to the intruder. However, improving one's standing with the Deep Ones is not too difficult. 
Placing a pearl on an abyssal altar near them can initiate an exchange of goods, which will gradually improve their opinion. Eventually, deep ones may gain such a favorable opinion of an adventurer that they will no longer flee their gaze and even assist in combat. The Deep One Knight is an even stronger species of Deep One. Like the other Deep Ones, they all share the same society and opinion of outsiders, and their approval and disapproval is all gained in the same way. Deep One Knights usually carry with them a trident or orthrolance, which they will use as a weapon during melee combat with opponents. Exchanging items is done in the same manner as with other Deep One species, except that Deep One Knights offer different items, usually those revolving around melee combat. This includes their signature orthrolance, along with tridents, armor, prismarine, and even a magic conch. The Deep One Mage is the third species of Deep One, and distantly related to the others. Yet they still fulfill an invaluable role in the Deep One society, mages have control over powerful water magic. Channeling the heart of the sea buried in their heads, these Deep Ones can summon bolts of water to pummel enemies from afar with. To voyage out of water, they can summon a bubble full of water to allow them to levitate. They can also bring forth a barrage of waves to damage multiple attackers at once. Some of the Deep One Mage's attacks will trap foes in a giant bubble of water, which can drown land duelers. Like all Deep Ones, mages have their own unique set of items they can exchange at an abyssal altar. These range from common ocean items to rarer and magical ones such as nautilus shells, bottles of enchanting and even the sea staff itself. Mine guardians are often difficult to see in the abyssal chasm, as they are always chained to an anchor on the seafloor around abyssal ruins. These mechanical beings were left there long ago, likely to keep deep ones away. Every so often, mine guardians will open their signal light to scan for targets. If a target is detected in close range, the mine guardian will begin to float towards the detected target, then suddenly explode once in range. If slain before this happens, mine guardians can drop a depth charge, which can be thrown to create a small explosion that can destroy blocks, even underwater. Bioluminescence dropped by gossamer worms, which can be crafted into a floater, a device that allows one to reach the surface of the sea in mere seconds, or it can be turned into some bioluminescence torches that glow even underwater. Any drowned that appear in the abyssal chasm may be wearing parts of the diving suit armor, these can also appear in chests in abyssal ruins. The diving helmet grants 40 seconds of water breathing when worn out of water, vastly extending the period in which explorers can stay in the abyssal chasm. The chest plate has additional toughness, the leggings grant extra swim speed, and the boots allow faster speed on muck blocks. The abyssal ruins can also occasionally hold a submarine. Submarines in disrepair can be fixed by using copper ingots on them, and any oxidization can be removed with an axe. Once repaired, a submarine can be piloted and even sports floodlights to improve visibility of the depths. When piloted, submarines provide a constant amount of air, making them one of the safest ways to get around in the abyssal chasm. Abyssal ruins also make use of drain blocks, provided there is liquid above and empty space below when activated with redstone, this block will move all the fluids above it below it. Deep ones can exchange a large variety of items, a common one is the ink bomb and glow ink bomb, which create a pool of ink when thrown that can inflict blindness and glowing, respectively. The glowing variant can be useful to gain the attention of a nearby hullbreaker. The gazing pearl can be a helpful novelty to keep track of the opinion held by the deep ones. It changes color depending on their mood towards the outsider gazing upon it. The Orthrolance is a melee weapon that can be held down to gain a powerful charge attack, this charge will leave a trail of waves behind it, which deal additional damage. The Magic Conch can be blown in order to summon multiple Deep Ones to aid in combat anywhere in the world. They will only linger for a short period of time, so it is best to save this for large battles. The Sea Staff is a weapon that fires a magical bolt of water rapidly, which can arc towards nearby monsters. 